Struck in the Eyes, article and video by investigative reporter Carol Harvey. On March 24, 2021, high winds drove waves toward the Treasure Island shore. A resident rode their wheelchair down Gateview Avenue with a friend and their dog. After a hospitalization, they needed a quiet outing. However, the trip was anything but relaxing. They and their neighbors have developed respiratory problems, breathing the gritty island wind that turned this islander's eye red. Tenants wipe fine powder from surfaces in their homes. Here, someone traced death by dust on a windshield. Tattered tarps on fences don't block construction dust. Trucks haul cubic tons of earth through streets and dump them in the construction zone at the front of the island where condos will be built. There, tractors grading the soil and trucks spraying water kick up more dust. The haze is thickened by radioactive dirt raised by Navy techs unburying toxic waste from cleanup zones. Toxins remain in the soil in an area covering a third of the island, and soil gas can blow up structures. Therefore, buildings that would protect future residents from wind sweeping in from the west can't be built on the western third of the island. Diagonal roads won't block powerful ocean winds, and high-rise towers will create wind tunnels in streets. To shield themselves from dust, the resident wore a head covering, aviator shades over glasses, and a mask. They traveled southwest on 12th Street toward San Francisco Bay. Crossing Avenue B, they followed the sidewalk between townhouses 1310 and 1312 Gateview Avenue. At Gateview Avenue, looking left over a meadow, the San Francisco skyline seems suspended on the horizon. Islanders live with denial or acceptance that yards, parks, pathways, streets, and townhouses are toxic. In the Bay Area's pricey rental market, most have nowhere else to go. Passing the meadow at the intersection of Gateview Avenue and Old West Side Drive, the resident risks exposure to a witch's brew of poisons the Navy missed during its decades-long cleanup. Facing the bay, they saw a contamination area bordered here in red, comprised of the meadow and the west side solid waste disposal area bordered in black. Radiation, chemicals, napalm, benzene, dioxin, and arsenic lurk in the groundwater, soil, and air. Until now, they believed distance and fencing around cleanup zones protected them. However, they didn't know they could be hit by shrapnel from weapons the Navy was blowing up inside the west side suite of Former islanders were poisoned in this spot. In 1991, Rachel Sullivan, a Navy instructor's daughter, suffered seizures at Townhouse 1310B, Gateview Avenue. Fifteen years later, in 2007, art student Violet Andrianaya also suffered seizures living a block away at 1325A West Side Drive. This drone shot shows how the same toxic area could make both women sick. Violet was sandwiched between the toxic meadow and a radiation dump where workers stirred up toxic dirt next to her backyard. I lived in the waste, she recalled. Dust clouds were so thick, the Navy plastic wrapped her windows. In 2014, whistleblower Robert McLean found off-the-charts radiation under rocks at the shore where Violet sat with her morning coffee enjoying the view. Radiation gave Violet years of tremors, nausea, dizziness, inability to stand, and fainting spells. Naval operations deposited radiological objects over the entire island. Radiation leaks occurred in Navy schools and labs marked in green on the map. This 2018 Navy chart lists low-level radiological object number one recovered in 2007-2008, and this chart lists low-level radiological object number 1280 that the Navy logged in 2018. The Navy mischaracterized them as low-level, but they were highly radioactive. Remnants of ship repair, LLROs, were also used throughout the naval station in smoke detectors, exit signs, sound-powered phone jacks, check sources for radiation survey instruments, radioluminescent dials, gauges, and deck markers. Some of these objects contain powerful thorium-232, americium, and strontium-90. Navy charts also list foils, radioactive enough to burn or kill. Foils were components of optical lenses and night vision metascopes assembled in the Building 3 optical lab. Navy documents stated that radiation could have been washed from this lab down a lead-lined sink from where it could have flowed along the length of the Avenue M pipeline into the community water system. 
The USS Independence was another source of radiation. It was covered with fallout after it was bombed in Bikini Atoll nuclear tests, then returned to Treasure Island. In letters to his daughter, Air Force Lieutenant Colonel Nicholas Kane described walking on the battered and scarred radiation training vessel when he attended a Treasure Island nuclear school in 1948. In 1950, someone spilled radium sulfate in a lab in Building 233, the Radiac Instrument Calibration School, located at 4th Street and Avenue M on the island's Berkeley side. Navy reports stated that radiation tracked unknowingly by students could have affected the groundwater to a depth of four feet. The Navy loaded 200 drums of radioactive waste from Building 233, furniture and carpets, onto the USS Independence and sunk the ship 100 fathoms in Monterey Bay, where it was filmed by NOAA divers in 2015. Finally, in 2013, reporters discovered high levels of cesium-137 behind a radium vault on Avenue M that held the radioisotope when the pandemonium was moved. Radiation scanning continues. In summer 2021, a resident photographed a test hole in this Gateview Avenue lawn where the Navy found a highly radioactive foil in 2014. How was this meadow contaminated with radiation chemicals and arsenic? In 1950, the largest radiation spill in island history out of the lab in Building 233 affected the area. Navy personnel were cleaned in Chemical Warfare School Decontamination Building 273, located just west of the meadow. Radiation from these decontaminations could have spread widely through the soil. For years, radioisotopes with long half-lives lurked in the soil beneath the resident's wheelchair. Chemicals got into the soil when, in 1957, the Navy set off a mock atomic bomb blast during a symposium on nuclear war. The weaponized chemicals napalm and benzene exploded over the bay onto water and land that later became the meadow, a radiation cleanup zone, and the heavily populated Gateview Avenue neighborhood. How did arsenic get into the meadow? Navy accounts of depositing the heavy metal arsenic used in rat poison into the meadow soil are unclear. However, during the 1939 to 1941 International Exposition, the side of the island facing the Golden Gate was used as a parking lot and later a runway for planes. Underground fuel tanks could have rusted and leaked gas. The Navy reported that total petroleum hydrocarbons, TPH, petroleum byproducts, converted into a huge arsenic plume or bubble that expanded beneath the meadow. Workers finally dug it out in 2016. So, for 28 years, the Navy exposed Gateview Avenue residents to arsenic washing from the meadow through cracks in their potable water pipes. After removing the bubble, the Navy seeded this tract of land that stretches in a brown-green swath to the shore where pedestrians walk and joggers run along a path over arsenic left in the soil. Across the meadow, the resident could see the western edge of a green-tarped cyclone fence surrounding the island's largest, oldest cleanup zone. This map depicts the west side solid waste disposal area, a 4.5-acre tract of land contained within the 93-acre housing area extending along the shore across from Angel Island. The Navy calls it Sweeta West Side. For 27 years, the Navy has dug out radiation chemicals, petroleum, and the heavy metals arsenic and lead from inside and around this toxic dump. From 1946 to 1963, the island was contaminated with chemicals when the Navy dumped its trash on the Golden Gate side. Five rubbish dumps are shown on this Navy map. Incinerating the garbage in burn areas and in pits reduced it to chemicals. In 1965, the Navy graded the soil and from 1965 to 1985 built townhouses over the pits. Then the Navy realized they'd built homes on a toxic dump. At first, they said they thought the ground was contaminated only with chemicals, but later discovered widespread radiation. In 1987, Navy officials identified sites for further investigation. In 1993, congressional approval of closure and redevelopment of Naval Station Treasure Island sent the Navy's cleanup into high gear. It erected fences around five areas in the Site 12 community where it claimed toxins were concentrated. 
North Point, Bayside, and West Side solid waste disposal areas along the shore, and Halliburton and Bigelow Courts surrounded by homes. In 2013, the California Department of Public Health criticized the cleanup. The Navy reacted by finding more contamination in areas of interest island-wide, but focused its effort mainly on removing radiation from the five fenced-off cleanup zones. The resident risked toxic exposure as they crossed Gateview Avenue and wheeled along the sidewalk behind their friend and the dog. To their left, they passed unoccupied Townhouse 1315. They continued toward a Monterey pine and a green sycamore shading the yard. From the green tarped fence stretching ahead, a black and white warning sign commanded, Caution, area under environmental investigation for hazardous substances, unauthorized persons, keep out. The cyclone fence snaked 50 feet off the sidewalk behind Townhouse 1315. In a cul-de-sac, yellow radiation signs were hidden from public view on a fence between buildings. The resident wheeled toward the end of Townhouse 1317, which was inside the fence. A few feet beyond, workers and trucks are admitted into the cleanup zone. From an access control point at the intersection of Gateview and Avenue B, Across Gateview sits a bus stop in a small park. The dog darted across Gateview toward Canadian geese, snatching insects and seeds from the grass. The companion followed the dog. The resident recalled, I was trailing behind the person and the pup. The direction we had just come from was calmer. The 1317 Gateview Avenue townhouse had sheltered the resident from dusty wind blowing hard across the sweeter from the bay. An untethered tarp attached only at the top was blowing from the cyclone fence like a rectangular green flag. As the resident swung right into the street after the friend and the dog, the tarp suddenly jumped. A strong wind gust caught me off guard and hit with stinging force, they said. A blast of hazardous substances came tunneling through the gap. The resident was struck at this spot. I felt an immediate sharp burning sensation in my eyes. Double glasses did not stop tiny grains from scratching the whites. Grit shot down their throat. A thick chemical film coated their lips, leaving a stinging sunburn sensation under their mask. The skin around their mouth began to swell. Dust and debris stung and coated their scalp, face, neck, wrists, and hands. They never imagined that inside the toxic dump, the Navy was blowing up Mark II hand grenades and Japanese mortars, or that shrapnel could strike them in the face. They began shooting photos and videos to pinpoint for the Navy and toxic substance control officials the exact location of the blast. Inside the opening in the tarp, two yellow radiation signs were strung between posts. Workers inside the cleanup zone were scanning with metal detectors searching for radioactive material and doing munitions sweeps. The Navy claimed it was shifting rows of lead-lined shipping containers to distance workers from hazardous fragmentation, but the containers were too far from the hole in the fence to protect people passing by. Pause the video here to view in this drone shot red stars representing weapons blown in place, two rows of shipping containers, and the blast zone where the resident was struck. Two weeks later, a young healthy person passed the blowing tarp and the opening in the fence, then crossed the street where the resident had been struck. Next day, their runny, itchy eyes and nose made them suspect something on the island. When the resident reached home, the mirror reflected red striations in their eyes as if dust, sand, or metal shards were scratching under the lids. Pressing cool, milk-soaked paper towels to their eyes and flushing with eye wash did not ease the pain. After two months, their eyes felt sore and gritty. The red and the whites had turned pink. Only applications of warm, wet tea bags gave relief. Four months later, it hurt to read. They worried their eyes were permanently harmed. In two weeks, their facial redness and swelling abated only slightly. In three weeks, their lips remained red, burning, swollen, and pouched out. They could not scrub the film off the skin around their mouth. 
Their scalp, ears, neck, and the backs of their hands and wrists stayed red, irritated, and burned. The blast re-aggravated their throat and lungs. They had a dry cough. To learn if they were struck in the eyes by shrapnel, dust laced with radiation or chemicals, napalm, benzene, dried tachyphyre, or arsenic, the residents sought out doctors, the Navy, the State Departments of Public Health, and toxics, who promised help at the February 8, 2021 San Francisco Board of Supervisors hearing on Treasure Island toxicity. Next, we'll describe the aid from these agencies the resident did and did not receive. 